Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. Happy Monday. Feels like we are so close to the end of the pandemic, and yet people are determined to uh, to screw this up. You you saw the pictures out of Miami over the weekend, uh, Miami 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 Beach, uh, where people basically said, "Hey, here's the part of America where uh, there are no restrictions whatsoever. So what the hell? We're going to go down here. We're not even going to pretend to engage in any kind of social distancing." The numbers are creeping up again in Michigan. People, we are so freaking close to being through all of this. So. I saw Tom Cotton on one of the Fox News shows saying, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great time to uh, lift all the mask mandates and mask rules because uh, we're very, very close to having everybody uh, vaccinated in this country, which would seem to be exactly the wrong answer. I mean, the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to get infected or infect someone and kill someone like the week before you are going to get vaccine, that, that, get the vaccine. That would be ironic. Uh, joining me on this Monday is Nicholas Grossman, who's a professor uh, out here in the Midwest, as well as a well-known uh, contributor to ARC Digital and to The Bulwark. Nicholas, thanks for coming back. Appreciate it. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I want to talk about a tweet. I want to talk about a tweet you had this morning. Okay. Mm -hmm. So R Rod Dreyer had a tweet where he's quoting a professor, Joshua Mitchell of Georgetown who just said in a speech that the cult of social justice slash identity politics is the greatest threat to the American nation since the Civil War, and only a revived Christianity can save us from tearing ourselves apart. Now, okay, I mean, I do think that some of this identity politics can be a problem, but as you ran through, threats to the American nation since the Civil War ranked seven, COVID, six, Great Depression, economic collapse, five, Nazi Germany, four, Imperial Japan, three, USSR, global communism, nuclear war, two, don't say that, that's racist. Number one, drag queens reading books to kids at a voluntary library event. I hope people get the sarcasm. It's just like, can people, have we lost the ability to calibrate actual reality and actual real threats versus things that are just highly annoying? That's been my problem with the larger social justice, woke, anti-woke, whole discussion, cancel culture discussion, um, is that I simultaneously think there is something there. It's not completely unimportant or unconcerning. Um, and yet at the same time, I think a lot of the criticisms over it uh, are just way over the top and absurd. And that it's one of those discussions where people are talking past each other and it's dominated by these extreme views. And especially with the fixation on on Drag Queen Story Hour, which uh, Sarab Amari was another one who, who made a big issue of it, that that was an entire cause of fighting with David French about the future of conservatism. Um, and it amounted to some people who they don't know reading books in a library where they don't live at a voluntary event that people choose to bring their kids to. And that's it. And I have a hard time seeing, you know, maybe this is libertarian of me, but I have a hard time seeing a voluntary reading event as a bad thing, as something that requires throwing away liberalism or, you know, a threat to the country on par with the Soviet Union or anything along those lines. Well, well if, you're, if you're going around the world looking at, the, at, at things to really be concerned about, you know, as a sign of the collapse of Western civilization as we know it, why would you pick out the drag queen story hour unless there were was not a lot of other things happening out there? I guess that's the point. And uh, at the same time, you have people who are worried about the threat of the drag queen story hour who are also concerned about cancel culture. But what are they actually asking for? They, they want to. Am I getting this wrong? Um, they want to cancel the drag queen story hour. They literally want to cancel it. Right? It sure sounds that way. And they want to use state power to cancel it. So not just social pressure and something where the consequence is, you know, perhaps say at worst, uh, losing a job or getting harassed, which is serious. You know, I mean, that, that's yeah. not nothing. But uh, no, they want to use state power to crush it. And uh, that is just a, another level in terms of trying to take away individual freedom. Okay, before we get into some of the other stuff, but you had a great piece in the uh, in, in in the bulwark about conservative fanboys and the sort of the coded language they they speak in. Uh, but we had kind of an interesting development over the last uh, twenty four hours. Uh, one of the, the the chief prosecutors investigating the Capitol attack uh, went on sixty minutes. Now he's the former prosecutor. He's he's actually just left this job. His name is Michael Sherwin, and he's on sixty minutes, and they were pressing him on. Well, with the hundreds of people that you're charging, uh, are you considering charging anyone with sedition? And we don't generally, I mean, that's on the books, 
but we don't very frequently charge anyone with uh, with, with with that. It's really since since John Adams, sedition has not been a really huge thing. But this is what uh, Michael Sherwin had to say. Do you anticipate sedition charges against some of these suspects? I believe the facts do support those charges. Uh, and I think that as we go forward, more facts will support that, Scott. Mm. So what do you think about that, uh, Nicholas Grossman, the fact that they are seriously talking about bringing charges of sedition would be kind of a clarifying moment, wouldn't it? I think it would be appropriate and useful for that purpose uh, that it was clarifying. I use the word sedition about the capital attack almost immediately. And the reason why is, according to U.S. code, uh, sedition or seditious conspiracy is using force to prevent the execution of U.S. law, to prevent or hinder uh, the execution of U.S. law. And that is very clearly what they did, that the capital attack was forceful for at least some people. It was a pre-planned use of force. And the intention was to hinder the execution of a very important U.S. law, of the law that is a core part of the peaceful transfer of power, of authorizing the election. So they used force to try to thwart U.S. constitutional democracy. And that strikes me as something that warrants a very serious charge, that it would be a good thing to have on the record. This is one of those things that is just way over the line that we use this rare, very serious charge for. I'm really glad you you you, you put it that way because it, this is a distinction that I think is important to continue to make. And of course, you know my my home state senator of Ron, uh, my home state senator Ron Johnson, you know, continues to try to uh, do the whataboutism about the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, other sorts of things, is suggesting that perhaps it was not as serious as it was. It was serious. Over the weekend, he said that he didn't feel threatened because they really weren't over on the Senate side, which would suggest that he's completely oblivious to the facts. But this distinction about what was happening on January 6th, this was not a protest. This was not just a random riot that burned some Starbucks or some gas stations. This was an attempt to stop the government from counting and certifying a presidential election. And it is remarkable the degree to which people are willing to you know, just simply forget about that particular distinction and bringing charges of sedition, I think would be, would in fact be clarifying, would draw that bright red line. This is not like these other things. And those other things, that doesn't mean that they are somehow not bad or not right. wrong. Right. You know, if you try to burn down a business um, or, you know, say try to burn down a courthouse, that is, that's serious. That yeah, are things serious. like uh, arson, you know, that's assault, but it's the level of problem that should be addressed by on one level insurance companies, but on another, another level, especially police, uh, you know, maybe state level courts. It's not a national security issue. It's not something that is directly attacking the United States government. No, it is. And and that, that does seem to be rather, rather important. Okay. So before I want to get to your article uh, over the weekend, there was a lot of back and forth about the shootings in Atlanta. And I thought you had a really good take on this, by which I mean a, a take that I personally agreed with. Um, there seemed to be this, 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 this uh, tug of war over whether or not we ought to regard the shootings in Atlanta as an anti-Asian hate crime or whether you would put it in a different box of misogyny or sex addiction or the Christian purity culture or or whatnot. And there were a number of people who were accusing the media of trying to cram this into their own narrative. This was all about white nationalism or white supremacy and that when in fact it wasn't which I don't want to get too meta here, but it struck me as that they seemed anxious to impose their own narrative on it. So you kind of did have the, you know, here, here's America 2021. Um, you have this human tragedy and there is this rush to, you know, which narrative can we fit it in? But so tell me what what, what your take was on this. The, the, the back and forth is white nationalism, sex addiction, misogyny, what? The short answer is that these things sometimes have many causes that yeah. it often doesn't fit neatly into one of these preconceived narratives. I teach about terrorism this is a thing I've been teaching about for the, at this point, about 15 years. And one of the things to focus on is, you know, whether something counts as terrorism or not and um, what that means about it. And much like with when we were talking about the capital attack, 
the, how we classify it doesn't say whether it's good or bad. It's just, uh, you know, what type of crime it is and what type of solution we might have to it. Um, and uh, this one was not terrorism in the sense that it wasn't political. It wasn't uh, trying to say send a message or change society. In a way, by contrast, the uh, Charleston church shooter goes into a historically black church, kills nine black people. And he had made videos about how he wanted to inspire people to fight a race war that he thought that white people were being unfairly oppressed right. and he wanted to do. So that's, you know, a political action. Um, in this case, there's no openly political element, no, you know, seeming to want to send a message or, you know, change things for other people. Um, there is a pretty clear misogynistic element. Um, there's something tied up in uh, attitudes towards sex. You know, a, a murder of sex workers is uh, unfortunately not that uncommon. Um, and, you know, fairly, say, a common target for people. Some of that tied up in uh, particular fundamentalist religious, religious attitudes about sex, although, of course, the vast majority of people who hold those attitudes don't then go and kill people. And some elements of race that I think you can't separate from it because he went to these Asian spas uh, Asian massage parlors, not to any of the other places. Like he didn't go saying, shoot up some strip club, you know, for example. And so if he is feeling that he, and he used these words about trying to stop temptation and the thing that he's tempted by are these Asian women. So there's a, a racial element to it yeah. also, but part of the white supremacy reaction to it was that if this is clearly white supremacy and that's all that's going on here, well, then, of course, the police, because the police are part of this system, the police will be on his side. And so there was a reaction to the police captain's description of investigators saying what they believed was the mindset of the killer at the time that then got put through these different you know, media and especially Twitter filters and ended up convincing a lot of people that the police were being very sympathetic toward the killer. And in looking at the actual words, I, I don't think that was really the case. And so that was a he good example. He was repeating of, what, the, what the killer had said. He wasn't saying it himself, the whole bad day stuff. Right. The bad day stuff was yeah. him paraphrasing the investigators right. who were in turn paraphrasing or describing, say, uh, the killer's mindset. And um, this is something that maybe a lot of people can't relate to. But since I've been studying terrorism for a long time, that I get very, I don't know, like detached from it. That maybe when you think about uh, people killing each other a lot, that one of the ways you can deal with it is to be kind of matter of fact and uh, detached and not, you know, say emotional about it. And that's at least how I interpreted most of what the police officer was saying. But I, of course, can't really know. But if you went into it thinking, well, this is clearly white nationalism, then you interpreted the police officer's words and you got more upset about it. And I would think that, you know, in finding out that it's not actually something where he was sympathetic, that, that would be good news. But some people seem to be bothered by it, like they wanted it to fit that narrative and it bothered them that it didn't. Well, I mean, it's, it's also as I'm watching this debate to quasi debate to playing out, it, it, it strikes me as that, you know, these explanations are not mutually exclusive. As you mentioned, they, they sometimes overlap. It's, it's messy. It's very hard to know what goes on inside somebody's in somebody's head. And so the. We, we we don't do we don't do nuance very well anymore, do we? In terms of, hey, maybe it's all of those things. Maybe it's not this. They, and, and also because everybody's got to have a, a hot take. You have to have the, the hot take within twenty four hours, and it's got to fit all of your preconceptions. You know whether or not you actually know what's going on or not. I find myself in these situations often being the person who says, "Just wait. We can get more information. Nothing will be lost by waiting a little bit." The Nashville bombing was a, a recent good example of that on Christmas of where yes. there was uh, thinking about it was part of this really grand plot to take down AT&T networks. And um, after and I just said, you know, maybe, but uh, wait, uh, let's look into it more. And after the FBI did, they determined that it was uh, a dramatic suicide, that he didn't have these larger uh, political or conspiratorial intentions for it. Um, and with the uh, Atlanta attack, there's also the issue that the Violence and uh, discrimination against Asian Americans uh, is real, is a rising trend that there are um, compared from 2019 to 2020, um, there was more than double the number of anti-Asian hate crimes in major U.S. cities. Um, there have been a number of incidents of discrimination reported to the various monitoring groups that um, look at these things. So there is also a real trend of rising anti-Asian discrimination. And that was maybe partially connected to this in some way, but not all that clear. And so in the same way, people who are, I think, rightfully concerned about the 
anti-Asian discrimination, looked at this and then immediately said, that fits my preconception. That must have been exactly what it was and nothing else. And it's more complicated. Now, to, on, on one level, if, if in fact it does raise, you know, our consciousness is raised about anti-Asian hate, that's a good thing. But I think we ought to distinguish between the, the facts of the circumstance and, and you know, things that we ought to focus on. Okay, so I want to talk about your fanboy piece. Um, and, and for people who haven't read it, I'm going to have to sort of back up a little bit here. This is, I suppose this goes in the category of the way that conservatives have increasingly begun to talk to one of them, talk to themselves. We use terms like memes and narratives a lot. There's a lot of talk about how a lot of right wing media is all about owning the libs. But I, but I thought you had a very interesting take the way you described this sort of insular folding in on themselves. That increasingly, if you were, you know, not a regular you know, consumer of Fox News and you dipped into Fox News or into conservative talk radio or many of these, you know, the Ben Shapiro world, it would almost feel as if you'd stumbled into some in-group that had its own code, its own language that you'd have a hard time understanding. So talk to me about that. You said, in speak has taken hold in right-wing media. Peruse conservatism Inc. these days, and you'll see it has become so dependent on inside references and shared fictions that it is inaccessible to the general public, even it's even as it is more thrilling to fans. So talk to me about what you're what you mean there. So I came up with this, I think, because I was watching WandaVision, the Marvel yeah, show. Which um, is outstanding. The- which I, I liked it too. I thought it was good. Um, and I, I was watching it at the uh, same time that Joe Biden gave his uh, big COVID speech, one year anniversary of COVID speech. And um, he said something about how uh, he hoped that if we can uh, stick to the vaccinations and you know if we can really uh, keep fighting the pandemic, that uh, we can be optimistic about July 4th. You know, We'll be able to have some yes. celebrations and get together for barbecues. And this was something that my wife and I watched the speech and we thought, oh, that'd be nice. And yeah. A lot of the conservative media bubble, conservative Inc., um, reacted to it as this was some really offensive thing and reacted to it then with second and third order references, almost like the random Easter eggs that I saw in WandaVision. So you had um, people like uh, Tucker Carlson saying, you know, how dare you tell us who we can spend the 4th of July with? And um, Ted Cruz tweeted this meme that was a, a grill with a steak on it that had a star above it. And it says, come and take it below it. And that was his whole communication about it. And that's something because I spent a decent amount of time in this world. I knew what he meant by that. But it was a level of like, you have to have seen the 17th Avengers movie to be able to understand this little part of WandaVision. That if you didn't understand already that, first off, uh, you were supposed to be offended by uh, Biden's comments and you were supposed to think that he was threatening your 4th of July barbecue, which, of course, the president does not actually have the power to ban those things. But, uh, you know, in theory that he was doing it. So you have to know that. And you'd have to know that the flag was um, a reference to the Battle of Gonzales from 1835 and the Texas Revolution when the Mexican army tried to take back a cannon. I, I missed that. <laughs> And you'd also have to know that, and so they use the come and take it slogan. And then also that come and take it goes back to ancient Sparta and the battle of Thermopylae against the Persians um, and the Persian empire um, and the Spartans resisting it. And they uh, said, you know, Molan Lab, come and take. Um, and this is a slogan that's popular with gun rights activists. So to really get this thing that Cruz was saying, you'd have to catch all those different references. And if you didn't know them, it would just look kind of weird. It's a, uh, you know, it's a barbecue and says, come and take on it. And that this is something that has been building for a while and kind of getting more and more insular and harder to um, access by outsiders. And so for someone who has seen the Marvel movies, um, watching WandaVision, I found that more thrilling. I liked it more. Right. But- you, get, you get a kind of a dopamine hit if you pick up the reference, right? Exactly. You know, yeah. Um, it's, and and it's, so here you would need that communication knowledge. to get it. Okay, so the, the the reference to one of this is interesting because I actually binge watched all of that, and I and I am old enough to remember all of those old TV shows or most of them. But I but I did find myself every once in a while stopping it and going and looking, you know, you know, going online to figure out okay which which show in which decade is this because it was a lot of it was this inside humor, and you didn't appreciate it unless you got the inside jokes, and I, I think that's a really good analogy because. 
you know what's happened is is that a lot on the on the right it is a lot of code speak uh, that you have to have all of these references and you have to have been marinating in in these references and these narratives for a very very long time to understand why you're supposed to be upset about this and I by the way had this exact same reaction to the whole July Fourth thing I thought it was nice it was aspirational I was thinking about it and then you go on you know into conservative media and it is it is it really is that alternative universe of of, uh, of 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 in, of indignation so but again this is part of that larger folding in on itself where the right is no longer trying to persuade it, it is just simply trying to stoke the indignation uh trying to come up with things to be ups, upset about um you know if you if you live in ben shapiro world uh there's no attempt to you know persuade someone that uh Joe Biden's uh, infrastructure plan is is you know is is, is ill conceived. It's all about ha ha ha. Look, he fell down on the stairs, or you know, here's this uh, you know here's here's this this gaffe, or how this relates to something that we talked about last week. You know what I'm saying? It's a it it it, it really is kind of this impen increasingly impenetrable universe. It's increasingly impenetrable, and uh, it was, you know, building for some time that there was a example of a Ben Shapiro uh, article in 2018. So, meaning not something he just wrote. I'm sorry, not something he just said, you know, off the top of his head, but something he wrote. So, presumably, could you know read over and edit. Um, when he was very critical of some Obama speech that Obama talked about, uh, he was critical of appealing to tribe, to fear, pitting one group against another. That was the Obama line that Shapiro didn't like, and he responded. And I have the whole quote here of. This is from the president who tut tutted actual riots, who suggested without evidence that police departments across America were syst systemically racist, who declared that a slain back teenager could have been his son, who deployed his vice president to say that Mitt Romney wanted to put black people back in chains. So I know what a lot of those are referencing, but I don't think everybody does. And an example of who declared that a slain, back slain black teenager could have been his son. So that is referring to the Trayvon Martin case. It was yeah. already six years old by the time Shapiro was saying it. There is no other explanation at all in the article about why that is bad or why Obama saying, you know, I have empathy in this case is a bad thing. Um, so you have to know both of those automatically. But the thing that has made it worse, so that was 2018, um, that made it worse was first COVID, um, in which the approach of the Trump administration and Trumpist media that followed was that um, it's no big deal. And um, you, you know, also that there are miracle drugs that you can go out and take and um, it's going to go away soon or just anything else to avoid acknowledging the reality of it. Then the election and the big lie associated with the election, how in this world you have to agree with the shared fiction that um, Trump actually won the election and don't pay any attention to all the court cases he lost or the fact that nobody saying this can bring actual evidence of it. Um, and then finally, with the Biden presidency, that Republicans and conservative media have found hard to attack and found Biden hard to attack during the campaign also because he doesn't fit into the radical left wing, either socialist or social justice activist frame that they would like and that a lot of their viewers are geared up to oppose that he's just not that. And so they try to build a kind of imaginary Biden to attack. You know, I it, it, it's funny you should mention this because I I don't know how I got on the mailing list because I, I do get a lot of that stuff from the Daily Signal now. And, and it's what you describe is exactly the way every single email reads. Although it also occurs to me <clears throat> that it explains, well, you know, why someone like a Ron Johnson, and I, I'm bringing this up because he's in the news, not just because I know him and and uh, am complicit in all of that, but why Ron Johnson says some of the crazy stuff that he does, because very clearly he's fallen down this rabbit hole, and he, you know, I, I, I perhaps unfairly said that uh, he sounds like somebody that reads uh, the Gateway Pundit, I, it's a big New York Times article yesterday. But he, but but I actually, you know, was thinking that where does he get his information? How does he get these facts? Uh, why does he use these particular narratives? And they they are instantly recognizable if you spend time in conservative media. And interestingly enough, and this will sound like a digression, but I dig digress all the time on this podcast. Um, I got a mailing yesterday from the Daily Signal, which is the Ben Shapiro group, basically from Ron Johnson, I will not be silenced. 
And so he's using the Daily Signal and the Ben Shapiro network to put out this, you know, I am a victim. I am the victim of cancel culture for saying these crazy lunatic things. So uh, again, every once in a while, you will hear a politician say something or a public figure say something that seems completely incomprehensible unless you understand what you've been describing. And if you have all those references, it makes sense. Yeah. And the problem, though, is the number of people, problem, say, for the Republican Party, um, is that the number of people who buy that stuff, who who catch all the references, who are part of that world, is not large enough to win national elections. It um, it might be close, but it is maybe more like the, say, um, Georgia electorate that turned out for the um, Senate special election in January that Democrats managed to win yeah. that where it was, you know, maybe 10% less than the Republican turnout in the general election. And the appeal to other people who are outside of it is very small because if you can't understand what they're talking about, if you can't connect to it, if you are a, if you're not a political junkie, then it doesn't even make any sense. It's not a, that there's something to agree with or disagree with. Um, it's that it wouldn't really register. Um, and this I think is part of where you see the impetus for, various efforts to make it harder to vote, that the Republican Party having concluded, and this is a fairly recent change, you know, the um, Ronald Reagan was the opposite on this and, you know, encourage immigrants and um, George W. Bush uh, signed a reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and here we are about 15 years later, where the Republican Party is, and it's not the first time anyone's done this, but um, putting a lot of their eggs into the voter suppression basket on the idea that they have this core and it's large, but not large enough. And they can really rile them up um, by, you know, in, almost in the same way that you'd get somebody riled up for like a new Star Wars movie. And then they can't actually get over the hump with that. And so they would rather there be fewer people voting. No, and that's exactly right. Uh, you, you, you made this this point, which I think is, is, is important. This assault that we're seeing right now on voting rights is and, and I, can, I can hear people in the background already saying, no, this is not new, but it is relatively recent. Um, yes, there's a long tradition of voter suppression in this country, but I keep coming back to the fact that, that the Voting Rights Act in 1965 was passed with 79 votes in the United States Senate, 79, when it was reauthorized under George W. Bush. I believe the vote was unanimous. You had a Republican president who re-signed the authorization of the Voting Rights Act. And now the one issue that seems to be motivating Republicans more than anything else, more than the spending of the national debt or the debt or any of those things, is making it harder to vote. So this is a relatively recent thing, and it is based on these narratives and these memes and these anecdotes that then become legends that determine the entire uh, the entire ideology of the entire ideological approach of the Republican Party right now. And these things are all part of the same thing that even back to the drag queen story hour stuff that if you have convinced yourself that you are under a unyielding existential threat, that there are things like a stolen election or, uh, I don't know, drag queens taking over every library or, or something, but, um, or a better way to put that, say, non-sarcastically is uh, that um, Christians, uh, religious people are being squeezed out of the public space yeah. and that uh, this is going to lead to your impending destruction. Um, or some of the uh, worse versions that have motivated terrorist attacks of theories of what's called the, the great replacement about how uh, immigration is a conspiracy to try to dilute the amount of white people in the country. Um, that uh, all of these things combined make it that then the only other people who, quote, get it are the people who are in that bubble with you, who agree with these core shared fictions. And if you start with that premise that there actually was a somehow stolen election, well, if I really thought an election was stolen, I would react very negatively to it as well. And yeah. I would take that as a very serious threat. And so if you take that, if you have to accept the fictional premise first, and you can see this in, in Ron Johnson kind of trying to scramble to figure out something that can connect the dots that start with the premise, try to make that connect to reality. You know, what excuse will you buy um, that all of these are part of that same thing of just a unwillingness to try to deal with concrete facts and to have disagreements on things like quite serious issues. You know, I mean, uh, taxes or foreign policy and war or something like, say, abortion. Um, that all those disagreements, those are still normal disagreements. It's not this 
existential, we are terribly oppressed people, we're victims, we need to stand together against these, if not totally imaginary, at least heavily exaggerated threats. Well, speaking of which, I don't know whether you saw this, I'm, I'm guessing that you you did. Um, you know, the, the Claremont Institute used to be a really solidly conservative, respectable mainstream organization. And it has become, became increasingly Trumpy and began, you know, putting out things like American greatness. But it, the, the president of the Claremont Institute is a guy named Ryan Williams, who I don't know him, a president, he's the president, he's the publisher of the Claremont Review of Books and, and the American Mind. And he tweeted out over the weekend, he found a tweet that said the U.S. Department of Defense sent out a memo directing U.S. military departments to promote and project uh, LGBTQI rights. OK, so that's the, the story. Basically, let's show more respect, make, you know, make sure that people's rights are not being violated. He saw that tweet and he said the modern this is what he tweeted. The modern uniparty whatever, seems quite committed to getting us into and then losing a war. The sad fact is that we will deserve it. Decadence and corruption on this level usually mean regime collapse is not too far around the corner, which struck me as a rather extreme reaction to this one memorandum on, you know, gay rights. And suddenly it's like we deserve to lose a war and, you know, we're going to have regime collapse and it's the end of Western civilization as we know it. So it's also this take something that you disagree with and make this absolutely hysterical Flight 93 election plus kind of reaction. And there was a similar one with Tucker Carlson making a big issue of women in the military and yeah, you know, right. the fact that they would, they're making some flight suits that fit uh, women, uh, women's bodies and including pregnant women. And yeah. the, you know, the logic of that is pretty simple. We have a volunteer military. We don't want to be turning away people who want to do it. You know, we'd love more people to do it um, rather than fewer. And uh, whenever you have something, you know, in this uh, women, gay, whoever, um, you know, uh, patriotic, willing to serve, great. And also when you have people who are going to say, take a leave of absence, for example, for having a child, you don't want their skills to atrophy. You want them to be able to do their job as best they can for the period that they can. And that's it. There really isn't all that much more to it. And so it was an um, an odd thing to get so upset about. And you had Tucker talking about the great masculinity of the Chinese military, which, you know, what a weird thing to praise them for, which also they, the Chinese military happens to have an obsession with their own insufficient masculinity. So that ad had a weird, uh, I don't know, uh, a rhyme to to those two different things, but so speaking yeah, of weird, hyperbolic, way over the top. Yeah, speaking of, of weird flexes, you, you you probably caught the, the the Fox News kind of cheerleading for Vladimir Putin in the, whether he's going to debate Joe Biden or whatever. I mean, um, Putin and the Russians were very very upset because Joe Biden described Vladimir Putin as a killer, which of course he is. And all there's so many parts of this that I like. You know, Trump world, you know, was telling us like two months ago that they love the fact that Donald Trump just sit, you know told it like he is. They loved his blunt, direct language and his insults. Now it's suddenly like, oh my God, this is just terrible. Joe Biden has actually called Vladimir Putin a killer. This is absolutely horrible. This is the dumbest thing any president has ever, ever, ever said. So it is this weird kind of rooting for Russia against... Um, again, th this is this is from the America First crowd, so it's hard to keep up, isn't it? As best as I can describe it, I think that is an example of culture war is everything. Mm -hmm. That mm. the um, enemies where it used to be kind of an organizing principle for the American right was opposition to the Soviet Union and to communism. Yeah. And that's been gone now for 30 years. And so it's been reorganized to at least a significant extent around opposition to the American left, the Western left, especially the cultural left and um, various social justice efforts. And the response to it ends up being things like like that, which are just, say, ridiculous and over the top of where, first off, Trump himself was never strong uh, with Putin. That um, was, you know, always obsequious and very flattering. Um, and even when the similar about, you know, Putin is a question, Putin is a killer question, Trump's response was to say, oh, you think we're so innocent, was to know, um, you know, denigrate worst. the United States in the process. 
Um, and so cheering on Putin this weird way where, um, I mean, I was very critical of Trump. I uh, never, you know, cheered on somebody like, say, Xi Jinping. I didn't cheer on China in the trade war. You know, I still wanted the United States to succeed, even if I thought that he was doing it poorly. And to see somebody where it's because merely Putin is opposed to Biden and opposed to Democrats, opposed to the American left. And that is the single organizing principle. And therefore, enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I would not have called a foreign authoritarian leader a friend um, or an enemy of an enemy in that regard. But that seems to be what their priority is. It does. And it's a, it's a long distance from what American conservatism used to be. So you and I were having a brief conversation right before we began this about how the Republican Party got to this point. And I know that's kind of a large question, uh, but you were making an interesting point. I wanted you to repeat it um, about, you know, going back to Obama, the approach of the Republicans and how it, it is part of the, the process of you didn't use this word, but the process of, of radicalization that's taken place, it feels like in the last 10 years. So give me your thoughts on that. So I think the origins for, and of course, there are many factors to this, but yeah. you can trace in part to the end of the Cold War and the remo removal of that enemy, and also the uh, Bill Clinton triangulation and Washington consensus, where effectively Democrats embrace markets and they embrace free trade. And as a result, the previous big left-right divide becomes something where people are now arguing over a few percentage points of income tax rates right. or um, you know, maybe specific things, and you know, which are worth debating, but are not these grand divisions. Um, and with Obama, there was, and part of this probably relates to his race, but definitely not all of it, that there was this impression that he was this crazy, radical, uh, left-wing ideologue. And then he didn't govern like that at all, where he, um, and you can ask, you know, any of the real left-wing ideologues or, you know, the real socialists, they were quite mad at him. So among other things, uh, in response to the financial crisis, there was a lot of pressure from the left to nationalize the banks. And he didn't, he bailed them out instead, and then quickly sold them back the stock that they had given the government. Um, and uh, he wanted to, you know, a left-wing ideologue would have tried to do a spending only stimulus. And the biggest item in the stimulus was tax cuts. And also Obama negotiated it down a couple of times. And the left-wing wants single-payer health care. And Obama did what was basically what Mitt Romney did in Massachusetts, but take it national and keep private insurance companies um, in there. And um, Obama did a lot of drone strikes, which the left got mad at him about. Um, and he repeatedly argued things like uh, in graduation speeches that students shouldn't shout down people or disinvite people that they disagree with, but should engage them and beat them on the battlefield of ideas. And so just overall, he is you know left of center, but he's very much a centrist. And yet, since so much of the right was really geared up to fight this left wing radical, they're just kind of kept on doing it and just saying that that's what he was and, you know, keeping people angry as opposed to thinking, OK, this is somebody who we disagree with on some big things, but can work with on some other things that that doesn't do the permanent campaign. That isn't culture war. That isn't, you know, this idea of a uh, cold civil war, basically. Um, and so the creation of this bubble of a lot of these different fictions come about because Obama was not that left wing radical. Hmm. And you could see that kind of a just going further in a lot of the attacks on Joe Biden of the trying to call Biden a tool of the radical left or maybe a radical socialist. And he's out there saying that he rejects Medicare for all. And uh, no, he won't just cancel student debt by fiat. And he's outspoken about how things like rioting and looting are bad, even as he's defending protests. And in the primary Kamala Harris tried to cancel him as a racist in the first debate, and <laughs> yeah. various left-wing journalists tried to cancel Biden as a rapist with what later we found out was a false, false. accusation. Yeah. Um, and so all of this where he's just, and also, of course, he's a old white Catholic guy. And so the idea of him as this crazy liberal just doesn't really fit reality. And yet that is clearly what a lot of the right really wants to oppose because that gives that additional purpose. It justifies taking this stuff as this hyperbolic threat to civilization as opposed to part of American democracy where you win some, you lose some. This is, this is, really, this is really good stuff. And I think it's part of the frustration that I think some folks are on the right are having with Joe Biden because he's not living up to that stereotype. So they have shifted the goalposts by, as, as you mentioned, that that he's this empty vessel. Okay, so 
though Joe Biden himself is not offensive. He's not scary in the way that we made uh, Barack Obama scary or the way that we could make Kamala Harris scary. But it's merely because he's senile and uh, he's a front for other forces out there, the, the radical left, which is using him as a figurehead. I mean, that's kind of what they've settled on, isn't it? It is, and that's the sort of thing that sells inside the Fox News cinematic universe, which was a yep. phrase that um, David Roth came up with. I wish I came up with that. It was just, it was just such it's a perfect good. phrase. But in the Fox News cinematic universe, that Biden is that you, you can say, okay, you know, he's not really the president. He's being controlled by other people. But that doesn't really fly for people who aren't in that world. They see Biden give up, get up and give a speech, or they see him give a town hall. And he sounds, you know, I mean, maybe older if you've been following him his whole career. Maybe there's been a few miles an hour lost off his fastball. But it doesn't sound anything like, you know, senile or dementia or, or anything like that. And so if people hear that and then they see him and then think, oh, you know, he sounds reasonable to me. And it doesn't sell outside of that bubble. And the bubble is big. It sells in there, but not really outside. Well, it sells in there in a, in a very big way. I'm, I'm getting a lot of feedback from people who are saying, you know, it, my, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, my uncle, my aunt, you know, are absolutely convinced that he is senile, that he is, you know, you know can't really function at all. And it, the obsession with that is so deep in that world. And I do think it comes back to what you're describing is, is that they need to come up with an explanation for people to be really terrified of somebody who is not that terrifying. So you, I think you they're going to. I just think they're going to shoot themselves in the foot as a result of it, that it's basically the same mistake that Democrats made with Reagan, that, you know, uh, he's old, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's not really in charge. And meanwhile, the, you know, genial old guy is winning over the broad center of America. No, that is true, is the is that you can make a mistake by demonizing. Um, so any thoughts about uh, Donald Trump coming up with his orange Twitter, um, that he's going to come up with his own social media platform? <laughs> he's going to launch this. Um, I, I'm sure that he's going to be able to do it, but I, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. Ex I'm not. I'm not sure how it's going to play. Does it cannibalize other social media platforms? Does it make him more marginalized? Is it going to become the new Trump stakes? What? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it might compete with, say, Gab or Parler, but I couldn't imagine it really being a success. We don't need another social media network that, you know, it's like, we don't need a second Twitter. We don't, we already have a Twitter. That's where everybody is. You have these networking effects where um, people are going there because that's where people are, right. not necessarily because say it's so, you know, the functionality is so wonderful. And so in Trump's case, I could see it being something almost like another way he puts out statements that puts out public statements. You know, if you're a Trump super fan, maybe you want to go and get it as soon as he writes it up there, um, uh, where he also has, let's say, not had the greatest follow up when it comes to various ideas that he's come up with and starting a technology company and making it succeed, especially making it succeed against these really successful ingrained companies like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram is very, very hard. And I I would be very surprised if something like that actually succeeds. We'll see if they even actually do it, as opposed to it just being an attempt to threaten people to try to get them to do something else. Yes, but in two if they or actually three weeks, do it, yeah, yeah, I doubt in it. In two or three weeks, we're going to have this major rollout, sort of like the two or three weeks for the next healthcare plan. Now, what, what I think is interesting is he's going to launch this. What happens if people criticize him on it? What happens when you have the, the, the anti-Semitic trolls, which decide that, hey, maybe we should move over from Gab to... Trump gab or, or whatever. How are they going to handle all of that? Uh, is he going to put in the energy to deal with that stuff? But I, I don't know. I think what's interesting though is that, uh, you know, this sort of belies the uh, the the claim that he's sitting down there in Mar-a-Lago and he's completely happy and it doesn't bother him at all that he's not on Twitter. Obviously, it bothers him he's not on Twitter. He hates. I, th I think he hates losing Twitter more than he hates losing the presidency. Really. I mean, I, I so otherwise, why would he be talking about doing this? Well, there are you know perks to the presidency as well, of course. There but, are some um, good ones. It, you know, brings a lot of work with it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I I like I think probably many of us in in these conversations are a uh, active Twitter user, and if I get cut off from it, you know, sometimes I take a break on purpose. But if I get cut off from it, I feel like I'm missing something, or I have some idea, and I think, oh, you know, I want to share this. Um, and he was a very active Twitter user, and he got tons of attention from it, and. 
Um, I imagine, especially from his perspective, that not seeing his tweets read on the news every day, read on the you know TV mm-hmm. news and having people talk yeah. about it um, is just a, a major downstep from where he was before. Well, I think that also creating his own his own platform is going to accelerate what you've been describing uh, here as this folding in and of itself where where it becomes more insular, more separate from the rest of the mainstream dialogue to the extent there is any in, in American politics and anymore uh because it will be it will be him it will be his super fans it will be um that world talking to themselves in their own coded language and so everything you've been describing would be accelerated by him moving away from these shared platforms do you think and who else would go on there i mean maybe some media to cover it although the trump as a, a subject of media has become a lot less interesting now that he doesn't have the power of the presidency behind him now that his words are not potentially previews of actions so who else is going to go there that i for one don't need to see the stuff that you know the the trumpist bubble i mean i i get enough of that on twitter and in other places and i get the variety of people interacting and various perspectives and get debates and one of the reasons even why parlor and gab haven't been that successful is because a lot of these trumpists found that the thing that they like most about social media is dunking on the left and on you know people they don't like so random posts from some you know democrat or liberal or progressive that they can then make fun of or they can uh, you know then trigger or anything else like that and without that part of it it's not as exciting for them it's not as fun and i don't know who else would go onto a trump social network besides people who just want to hear from donald trump and want to live in a safe space that says that he somehow won the election well, that's probably going to give him some tens of millions of followers, which will satisfy him. I mean, for him to sit in a room and be surrounded by people who are just, you know, feeding back how wonderful he is, is uh, not, you know, not the worst thing in the world for uh, for Donald Trump. Nicholas Grossman, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it very much. You can find uh, Nicholas uh, at Arc, Arc, Arc Digital um, on the Bulwark and, of course, uh, on on Twitter, where I have to say that I have to restrain myself from not retweet, retweeting you all the time because your stuff is very, very good on Twitter. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again.